Global Governance Futures is brought to you from the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. How does the world hang together? What has gone wrong? And what has global governance got to do with it? To learn more, please visit ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. Professor Michael Barnett is one of the most highly regarded global governance scholars of his generation. Michael cut his teeth as a grad student working on Middle East geopolitics, with this experience indelibly shaping his view that understanding global politics cannot be reduced to guns and steel, but must also contend with clashing identities and values. He went on to apply this insight in a series of groundbreaking publications on the pathologies of state power and international organizations in the context of genocide, and humanitarian assistance, exploring, in his words, why and how good international organizations go bad. Skeptical of more idealist accounts of global politics, Michael injected a healthy dose of real politique into the global governance debates of the 2000s, noting how the concept all too easily skirted over questions of power and served to cloak liberal biases inherent to the post-Cold War era. Today, these reflections lead Michael to wonder whether the concept of global governance as we know it might have reached its sell-by date. And I think that's global governance 2.0, and we've been living that now for most of this century, in which we no longer think about solving the big problems or creating you know, a larger pie for all of us to enjoy, but it's now, how do we minimize the worst possible outcome? You know, global governance is always a sign of the times. And I think that times have moved. This is Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. Professor Michael Barnett is a university professor of international affairs and political science at the George Washington University. His research spans global governance, the UN and humanitarianism, as well as global ethics. We spoke with him in October 2023. Where to begin? It's obviously a, a long uh, and distinguished career, both as a critical theorist and as someone who's not shied away from some of the really big, challenging topics in global politics. And I, I was, you know, it was interesting to find out that your earliest work was actually on the Middle East, uh, grappling yeah. with conflict, grappling with uh, the, the entrenched politics in the region, which is obviously very topical at this time, given what's happening. Uh, between Israel and Gaza. More recently, you've done work on genocide, on humanitarian intervention, a large body of work on humanitarianism. Uh, and I was, I was really curious to begin this conversation, perhaps at, um, you know, at the at the early stage of your career. I mean, you really came of age as a scholar at the end of the Cold War, the late 80s, you did your PhD <laughs> at Minnesota. Yeah, with, I guess I did. <laughs> with, with Raymond Duval. Who, of yeah. course, is a is a is a is a sort of a legend in critical security studies. Uh, you made major interventions through the nineties uh, around critical security, particularly on the concept of security communities with Emmanuel Adler as well. But you also retained a kind of critical edge during that that era, that sort of liberal triumphalist era. I mean, you were. I would say skeptical of the more idealistic accounts of global politics. And I also understand that you were actually at the US mission to the UN when the Rwanda genocide occurred in 1994. So I was curious to ask, could you give us some insight into how you navigated the 1990s, that strange time mm -hmm. as, as a British journalist put it, you know, the uh, sort of a holiday from history. How did you navigate the strange paradox of that era? The, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know, I I didn't really see it as the best of times, I guess, in terms of my own lived experiences. Uh, as you note, I began I began as a scholar of the Middle East, uh, mainly the international relations of the Middle East, and and that that was you know a, a, an effect of my longstanding interest in the region. And so when I went to Minnesota, that was my goal was to come out of the program with that with that um, uh, occupation, preoccupation. And uh, I should just note at Minnesota, it was a time in which there was, at that point, sort of an inchoate 
set of readings and people that eventually organized around constructivism. So uh, I would say both the Middle East and my own in indoctrination initiation into constructivism at that time what had a profound impact on me. Uh, I was in the same class with Alex Wynn and Yuta Weldis. Uh, there were a lot of people behind us who also ended up, you know, becoming very much esteemed within uh, constructivist work. So I don't know if it was in the water. Uh, I was always sort of a little bit uh, outside that in part because of my interest in the Middle East. And um, and I thought that's kind of what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And um, a few things happened along the way. Uh, one, one was that, you know, I would say that my interest began to expand a bit. And here I would say it was largely due to this really incredible opportunity I had from the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, they have these uh, awards called International Affairs Fellowships. I uh, I got one. Um, I ended up at the U.S. Mission to the U.N., where I was first in the Political Military Affairs Unit working on Somalia. This is back in 93. Black Hawk Down occurred then. Um, and at, at that juncture, at least within U.S. foreign policy, our policy towards Somalia was just there should be no further injuries to any American soldiers. So they kind of hunkered down and they weren't even supposed to get a hangnail. And so there was less for me to do. And towards the end of that year, uh, there was a decision made that, you know, not completely trusting this outsider who's an academic, that I would take on a few of the UN peacekeeping operations. They would be part of my account. Uh, Rwanda was one of them. And it was a sign that how little US, <laughs> let's say the US national security establishment cared about Rwanda, that you know they would hand it to me. Uh, so I started following Rwanda in late 1993. And so when the genocide occurred, I was there with a front row seat uh, flying in the wall. And it had a, you know, it's difficult for me to even say this because of the real trauma and suffering occurred, obviously, in Rwanda. But I think me and so many others who were even eyewitnesses to this uh, from afar uh, were, you know, traumatized is, 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 is not the right word, but I would just say deeply affected by what we had seen, what we had experienced. And with a jumble of emotions, uh, I, for one, for instance, spent a fair bit of time after that first year defending the UN's decision not to go in. And I, and I still think that was perhaps the wise decision, uh, as awful as it was. Uh, but what was shocking to me was that the UN didn't even try, uh, that there was kind of a collective acceptance that everybody would just stand aside, not just the US, not just Britain, not just everybody in the world. Um, and I began to ask myself, you know, why was that? You know, what happened? What was going on? And what happened to us? Uh, because there were people who really, I, I think, are, are well-meaning, uh, care about the suffering of others, but nevertheless found that their own moral compass pointed away from intervention. And so that got me more deeply interested in the culture of the UN and more broadly, the culture of bureaucracies and the culture of, if you will, global governance broadly understood. And you know, I spent several years kind of in a, I, I think not in a cave, but really trying to work through these issues. In the meantime, I was finishing what would end up being my last solo author book on the Middle East. 
Um, but, you know, Rwanda remained very close to everything I thought about. I mean, I, there was times where I wouldn't, I, I would, I would never miss a day without, you know, thinking about Rwanda. Um, and, and so I would say that the, these issues of concern for genocide, uh, later for humanitarianism, uh, and international organizations and global governance really, you know, if I were to trace it back, really, you know, could be traced to there, to that moment, uh, and sort of what it unleashed in me. Um, and then, of course, there were, you know, other, you know, there were other coincidences along the way or, or fortunes, including, you know, the collaboration with Marty Finnamore. Uh, where, again, taking apart, you know, and for us, I remember our lunch where we sort of looked at each other and Marty had been studying the World Bank and I'd been at the UN and we just kept wondering, why didn't our parents tell us about these aspects of the UN? Why is it there was no conversation about what these things actually did and what they look like? Uh, because still today, I think there is this interest in explaining why global governance institutions are created, uh, but very little interest in what happens after creation. Of course, that's changed, but that was kind of the beginning of our conversation and, you know, deciding that we would see if we could do something about it. Um, but, and then, you know, in in the writing of that book, uh, we had divvied up the cases, and I was interested in refugees. And so that obviously, you know, it was a stepping stone to my greater interest in humanitarianism. And I've really never looked back. Well, thank you, Michael. I mean, there's so such a, a rich overview there, many threads I think that we can we can draw out and explore further. Uh, I think you've described in the past that um, your work has really been an exploration of, quote, why and how good international organizations go bad. Yeah. I think it's very helpful to understand the context that you're coming from, exploring that. And certainly as a human rights scholar, you know, I've been very interested in sort of the, the, the revisionist accounts such as Samuel Moyne's work and so on who have actually looked at the 1990s as a particular era where, you know, they say even after the end of history, uh, you had civil wars, you had genocide, you had fundamentalisms of different kinds. These things were not, they were not of the past. They were still with us. Oh, um, yeah. And, and so I guess to go back to your original question in terms of uh, the sort of, I was aware of, of, um, certainly the emotions and the sentiment that were taking place at the global level in and around the UN that we can make a better world, we can actually produce progress, we can produce peace and prosperity and justice. There was that very clear messianic uh, overhang after the end of the Cold War, but that wasn't the world I was experiencing. Uh, and I'd always had an interest in the Middle East and, you know, we'd had a a touch of a, I guess, a moment with the Oslo Accords, but most of the world that I was studying was um, in deep despair, in grief, uh, embedded in violence. Uh, th this is, you know, the this uh, the liberalism as understood at the time in the West was, you know, not not evident in the places I was. You know, I was thinking about. And you were also, or you you are still regarded as a leading light in constructivist theory. And just to explain what that is to our audience who perhaps aren't familiar with those terms, you know, that's really this argument that identities, that values, are consequential to understanding global politics. That it's not just about material capabilities. It's not just about military strength. And sort of weaving those ideas with your background in the Middle East, I'm also curious to ask, to what extent for you, 9-11, 2001, was really 
a a watershed moment i mean to what extent did did the world actually change and to put a little bit more meat on those bones i have a colleague who recently said to me that uh carl rove in that very famous perhaps apocryphal uh, comment he made to a journalist where he said we're an empire now and when we act we create our own reality my colleague said you know carl rove was the arch constructivist of the 2000s yeah you know I know that most policymakers will say they're realists, uh, and, and that's because, you know, it's something of a signaling. Uh, it's partly due to the fact that they don't, you know, they're not aware of any other way of calling themselves. Uh, I'm not, you know, occasionally we have, you know, I'm a liberal, uh, but the idea of a constructivist doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't resonate. They don't know what it is. Um, and but in, in fact, uh, I came out of my period in this kind of realpolitik U.S. mission to the U.N. more convinced than ever that the world was constructed, that that in fact the people I was watching and their lived experiences was very much constructivist. Um, I mean, this was a moment where there was a lot of fluidity, where there was a lot of attempt to try and get some kind of fix on the world uh where you know you know i remember after the end of the cold war one of the you know great phenomena that was taking place was you know every country seemed to be going through its own search for meaning and identity that the cold war had so clearly locked people in into their own social locations and social identity that now that the cold war was over you know, the U.S. was going through, what are we about now? What's our going to be our next mission? I had friends from Turkey who spent a lot of time dissecting these debates over the Turkish national identity. So, you know, it's, it, and those were primary because until, until at least leaders had a fix on what those were, what is our identity, what are our beliefs and our values, they didn't know how to act. Uh, and they needed that sort of, pro they needed the roots before they could actually figure out what direction they were going to turn. So, you know, I, it, it wasn't simply me, if you will, imposing a kind of constructivism on what I was watching. It was actually just watching the people who were grappling with these, you know, major changes as they saw them and how to locate themselves somewhere in them so um you know i and and that's that's also partly why you know marty and i spend so much time thinking about organizational culture and this question of categorization and classification and you know this is about knowledge as we saw it in a, in a constructivist vein uh this is you know the other part of constructivism was also about um, the underlying conditions, you know, what makes the world possible? Uh, what makes the category of responsibility to protect possible? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that, you know, people like me were, and still are trying to grapple with. Um, so that's, you know, and for 9-11, you know, I, re I remember exactly where I was when, you know, someone called me and said, turn on the TV and watching these planes crash. And, you know, it was surreal uh, for sure. Uh, but also thinking whatever we thought our world was is about to change. Um, that, yes, that it was going to uh, completely change how the u.s saw itself at that moment and our reaction was probably going to be you know one of the effects would be to change the rest of the world uh to meet our or to adapt to our own sense of reality so yeah it was there was a before and after uh clearly uh you saw this in terms of uh not just simply uh strategic policies, but also in terms of basic questions of civil rights, civil protections, 
um, and, and so forth. It, you know, it had a very chilling effect. And of course, um, Afghanistan, I can, you know, at the mo at that moment was, I, I think, a reasonable response. Iraq, of course, was an act of fools and, you know, ended up being, I still think today, the, the worst foreign policy decision that the U.S. has ever made. Um, hi, Michael. Uh, my name is Zubair, and I had a question when it comes to RTP and, and how you talk about what makes peace possible. So I, I read your piece um, called um, Is Israel on the Precipice of, of Genocide? Oh, and that's getting that the article, word you... a lot these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that was a really, I, I, that, I found that really interesting. But um, in that, you list, you list um, eight boxes that of common risk factors of genocide all of which you argue israel ticks and if we read um israel's finance minister's words um as intent to wipe out um the palestinian village of hawara um and you couple that with the eight checked elements and the data that says um there's three thousand palestinians have been killed in gaza and the fact that israel has now bombed both the hospital and a humanitarian aid oh. warehouse. Would you? Would you know? Yeah. There's there's actually no evidence yet that Israel has bombed the hospital, uh, and in fact, you know, uh, so I think I would put a pause on that for the moment. Okay. Um. All right. Okay. Maybe not that part. Um. But um. The killings of Palestinians in Gaza, and um. The reports about a humanitarian aid warehouse. Would you now say that um, Israel is, mi is miles away from the precipice of genocide and maybe going into um, actively carrying it out? Yeah, I, you know, part of what I was, you know, it was obviously a pol obviously a deeply political piece, and um, and and as backdrop. Uh, the most recent edited collection I, I did was called Israel, the One State Reality, um, and uh, wrote it with Mark Lynch and Nathan Brown and Shibley Tohami. And we had a, a piece that came out at the same time in Foreign Affairs on this. And one of the things I wanted to explore that we did not, you know, we could only do so much in, in the volume in the, in the piece. Um, was in many ways, what's next? Because, you know, as you say, I was alarmed by the rhetoric. Uh, for me, it had, you know, shades, similarities to the other kinds of rhetoric of dehumanization. You know, I, I saw it in Rwanda um, and in other places. And, and so for me, it was very worrying with this, with this right-wing government and these right-wing ministers. And so, you know, I'd done this before. I wanted to see, you know, how does this stack up, not just simply in terms of the eye of the beholder, but the early warning indicators that the UN and other agencies have used to try to gauge, are we on the verge of, you know, and I'll, I'll set aside the, the genocidal language, but just atrocity crimes which is a you know broader category and because one of the things I'd always worried about was and genocide was a possibility as I you know given the conditions uh, but I I always worried it would be more like ethnic cleansing or or the Israeli vernacular is transfer and I think we're seeing that in the village you said but another village is just this week uh, in which Palestinians are being once again uh, dispossessed. And yeah, and so what are the conditions that would make that possible? I mean, again, this goes back to those conditions of possibility. And, um, and it is to say that the ground is fertile at this point, that it doesn't mean that it's deterministic, that it is inevitable that Israel will take those next steps.
but it is to say that whatever emotional cognitive barriers have been put into place before have been removed and 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 those are those conditions of possibility so um i do worry um i do worry i um you know it's sometimes hard to disentangle you know especially in this at this moment what is within israel's right of self-defense versus what is a more um malevolent set of strategies which often emerge during the heat of war um and and, and so the, the current moment worries me deeply on any number of levels uh i think it's you know what happens to gaza what happens to the west bank in in that piece that you cite i speculated that there would have to be some kind of trigger a massive trigger one that shocked Israel, where it said that the status quo, whatever it is, is no longer tenable, where uh, we now face a situation of an existential threat that forces us into a situation where we must do awful things in order to maintain our survival. And, you know, obviously that that might describe our current moment. So yeah no i'm you know this is yeah you know, i've been living this for the last couple of you know last 10 days like everybody else and it's it's um uh beyond beyond belief uh seriously and and it is only going to get worse and it, it's you know tragic doesn't begin to describe what what's taking place on the ground thank you for that um i have a, a small follow-up um regarding um when you talked in um i witnessed a genocide how basically they they had figured out that the the world community would not lift a finger to to stop what was happening and do, do you think that's the case now um because we've seen a, a a very loud silence um when it comes to a certain side and very um a, a big outpour of support for the other so do you think that's happening again um it can seem that way but i would say for different reasons uh that in, in the case of rwanda and this is where i'm sympathetic with the with the no intervention uh, i mean this is a moment when you know there was but there were two other big crises that were taking place there was somalia and the overhang of black hawk down and then there were were the tragic situations in the so-called safe havens in bosnia uh that were just being shelled mercilessly and nato was there you know european forces and didn't do much in response and so the idea then of sending you know what would amount to be a ragtag UN force, um, and, and the UN that was already on the forces already on the ground were were pretty bad uh, for the most part. Uh, there, there were Belgians who were leaving and the Ghanaians who were pretty good, but that was about it. Um, you know, you could send them in, but they'd just be sacrificial lambs, without a doubt. You know the the part that kind of um, that again in retrospect in Rwanda that 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 I I didn't think of at the time uh, was sort of in the back of my mind. But if you wanted to end the genocide, the best way would have been just to arm the RPF and let them declare victory, because that's when it ended. But this idea that we we have to be even handed, you know, which was obscene. So I, I think it called for a little more creativity. You know, this is the way genocides and atrocity crimes end usually is that one side wins. And this is a case where you sh just needed to pick the side. Now, I, I think, you know, I guess I read things a little differently in terms of, of you know, what's taking place right now. There's a lot of Western support, obviously, for Israel. And um, 
you know, but I also know that behind the scenes, there's a lot of pressure on Israel to maintain its compliance with the laws of war, uh, whether Israel does or does not. And as you know, the the kind of discourse of military necessity can often be a covering claim for almost anything you want to do. Um, but, um, you know, I think the worry for so many is, you know, how do you, you know, as they call it, restraint uh, in a situation where the Israelis have made it very clear, like Dick Cheney, they're going to take the gloves off. And, and Hamas has made it very clear that they don't want the civilians who are their human shields to leave or to distance themselves between them and and the fighting and many Gazans who are deeply worried that if they leave they'll never be allowed to come back uh that they'll be dispossessed once again so it, it's you know and is there a role for an international intervention under those circumstances i no not at all unless unless this intervention wants to decide which side they want to fight for or, or against um so, you know, this is where, again, there are a limited number, I think, of options available uh, beyond simply, I, I would say, reminding the Israelis of IHL and also reminding the Israelis that of the inevitable UN investigation and ICC indictments that are going to be followed up. And they should be very aware of those, that there will be, you know, you'd like to do prevention, but there will be accountability. Thank you for that. My name is Hannah. Um, I also had a question relating not directly to Palestine, but since we have seen, for example, with Palestinian refugees, that they are not under the mandate of the UNHCR, so their definition is slightly different. And that made me think of um, how you say that international organizations are able to kind of structure, uh, construct the social world. So I was just wondering, um, by doing this, they sometimes or quite often um, seem to create inequalities. How do you believe that we could reform them in a way that would cause less or like more equality and less inequality? And inequality of what, particularly? Well, for example, with the Palestinian refugees, to just stick with this example, um, they, by being classified under the UN Relief Works Agency, they do not have the exact same right of return that other refugees would have, and they cannot be protected in the same way. So do you believe that like, and we've seen this with other classifications as well, how do you think that international organizations could perhaps use their power to construct the social world better? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, the circumstances under which UNRWA was created, uh, obviously before even the creation of the UNHCR, uh, you know, were rather peculiar. It's the only international refugee agency uh, that attends to one single group, uh, which, you know, and and there's been a lot of controversy over UNRWA over the years, uh, including a definition of refugees that's actually a little bit wider than uh, what one finds, or at least the way they've practiced it that one, one finds in, at let's say UNHCR. Um, in, in terms of some of these rights, uh, again, UNRWA was created prior to the Refugee Convention. So, and a lot of those rights were hammered out in the context of the convention itself. But, um, you know, as a practical matter, um, you know, there are three possible solutions. There's one of repatriation, uh, the other one is third party uh, resettlement, and the other one is integration into the host society. And, you know, there's for the Palestinians, uh, there's, you know, well, repatriation right now is off the table and probably will be, but that's not unusual since most of the world is now in a position where it doesn't, you know, really want. You know, repatriation is one of those possibilities, but, you know, it's it's something that's 
difficult to accomplish in many cases. Uh, third country resettlement is, you know, often off the table and host country integration is, you know, often difficult to um, eventualize. The, uh, the consequence then is that like the Palestinians, there's so many people in the world that are just in limbo that are, that are just hanging uh, in this kind of uh, empty space where they're not citizens, they're not something else. They've got limited number of rights. Uh, they're often in camps for generations. So it's, it is, as Hannah Arendt told us, it's one of the world's foremost tragedies. And the question is, how is the international community set up to deal with it? And the answer is it's, it's not, um, and it would, won't be. Um, so, you know, what, what does that mean for the Palestinian refugees? Um, you know, the hope was always, I think, although there is the there is the question of the right of return, was a separate state, you know, where Palestinians could go home to or call home. And, you know, that's now off the table too. So we're we're really, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll close by just saying that um, Israel is a one state reality. There are grievous inequalities. And, you know, most people focus on the West Bank, but Gaza is part of this too. And I think if anything, what's taken place over the last 10 days is to remind everyone that Gaza still exists and that, you know, at the end of the day, Israel is still in the same place it is that it was which is that a refusal for a political settlement and i would also say the absence of you know effective palestinian leadership hamas is not effective and neither is the palestinian authority so i i don't know what that holds for political negotiations for the future hi michael um hey. i'd love to jump in on this because I think what we've mentioned so far about the Palestinians in particular, uh, it acts as quite a good example uh, about something that you mentioned in a paper about COVID-19 and sacrifice. Um, and it was the sentence toward the end where you discuss individuals whose sacrifices go unseen and whose deaths we don't get to grieve. And part of the reasoning behind that was the great number of these people they sit at the periphery of the liberal order and in some cases even outside of it and i think that's a really interesting idea that there's some sort of frontier separating you know the the dominant international order and who or whatever lies beyond it um and yeah i was wondering if you could expand on this idea of there being a periphery and maybe explore the outer rim a little bit, maybe other groups, countries, or organizations that exist in this space, you know? Yeah, you know, and, and, and clearly, you know, my own work on humanitarianism deeply informed that piece, uh, even to the point of the idea of a sacrificial international order. Uh, that came from a, a, a veteran of MSF, who uh, wrote an essay you know, a while ago uh, talking about the sacrificial international order and you know his fundamental insight which has always stuck with me was that all orders need their fair share of sacrifices uh, that there are always going to be those who are deemed as an unfortunate death of some sort or maybe even a necessary death um, he doesn't really attach that argument to the anthropological literature on sacrifice, but um, I, I thought what he had to say was very astute and creative, uh, but again, pointed us to the margins of those who are vulnerable, those whose lives can be lost without any mourning or grief 
And I was, you know, quite moved by th this kind of um, these conceptual images. The um, and it also is, you know, in a Foucauldian sense, those who are allowed to live and those who are let let to die. Um, so it it is, and it's not simply those who are on. I mean. Oftentimes when we think about the periphery or those in the margins or those who are vulnerable, you know, sometimes we think of them as on the other side of the borders, but obviously there are sacrifices at home too. Uh, we know them and, and, and COVID, I thought for me, COVID was a moment in which those sacrifices were clearly at home, but also abroad. And why was it, you know, again, looking at those underlying conditions, you know, what was it that permitted such tragedies to happen, these unnecessary deaths, as humanitarians might call it. And, you know, and, and so I was really quite interested in, you know, what was taking place at the level of, in many ways, global ethics. Uh, that had always been there, but I thought could shine a light then on what was taking place in COVID. Uh, but it was always to suggest that this is something that travels with all political orders and that we need to be aware that even in the case of a liberal order, which we often suggest, you know, of equality and equal dignity and all that, uh, which sounds nice, you know, but in fact, it's still filled with hierarchies. It's still filled with violence. And, you know, to return to what I think is often overlooked, which is that, and this, that even liberal orders need their fair share of violence. And liberalism is not always the democratic peace. There's a lot of violence that occurs under the name of liberalism. And so to, you know, bring us to attention about those forms of violence, both direct and structural, that occur under liberalism as well. So there's a there's a bigger set of arguments that are lurking in the background, but it is once again, and I, one last point on this is that oftentimes, you know, and it frustrates me that these debates over the liberal international order often you know, take the view from on high, you know, what's the U.S. think, what's China think, and so forth and so on, when in fact, I think the best way to understand any political order is from below, from those who are being sacrificed, those who feel the sharp edge of the elbows, uh, who, you know, who are the ones who, who feel the boot across their neck. Uh, those are, I think, better ways of thinking about not just political orders, but also power. Um, it's so it, it is to bring to bear attention to these other elements that can be opened up, as I think a lot of us do when we think about either human rights or humanitarianism, about the way the world is seen as, you know, how it's organized from the vantage point of those who have been marginalized. I think what you're saying also it speaks to a even deeper question which uh you dealt with in an essay that you wrote afterwards about the liberal international order which also it almost felt like an unofficial follow-up from that one about covid mm. uh, and you made an argument in there that I thought was really important uh and it was that individualism is one of the reasons for the decline in the liberal international orders moral foundations and um i wrote a dissertation on a very similar topic and i think it's like super pertinent this obsession with prioritizing individualism in my opinion underscores uh, a great number of issues that we face from like you know extreme poverty um populism you know properly handling climate change i think all of these issues interact with individualism in different ways so would you be able to build on that in any way yeah no i i you know i i think that's an interesting argument i mean my 
and, and you're right the this this question about sort of the the underpinnings and uh the if you will degrading of the liberal international order right people will be debating it for even whether it existed but assuming it existed we'll be debating its demise for decades forward uh there are a lot of very important scholars that have argued for a long time that liberalism and its radical individualism denies any kind of real community any kind of moral community at all uh because ultimately it is self-referential and in the extreme you know it's like what your well your former prime minister you know thatcher said uh with respect to neoliberalism right there is no society uh and i i think she articulated very well uh this notion that if it is about individuals they may aggregate at some point because they have to interact with each other so they need some rules for the road uh but the idea that there's anything that's greater than the sum of the parts is nonsense uh there is no community there are no moral bonds there's no kind of solidarity uh because you know liberalism ultimately is about process it, it doesn't really tell us about the moral ends uh for which we should strive and so you know this idea then of a disintegration coming with individualism is something that's you know people have, have pointed to for decades uh, my colleague who just recently died, Amitai Etzioni, uh, spent a long time, you know, trying to emphasize the community, communitarianism as a way of fighting against this kind of individuation that is occurring in society. And that's that's been an ongoing struggle and an ongoing problem. And we see the excesses. On the one hand, you have from the global economy, you have a detach and growing inequality without any real and the and the shredding of the safety net. Um, and then you have those who, you know, for some, the explanation for populism and nationalism is itself a kind of morbid symptom of a society that no longer exists. So, yes, I you know i i i think that's an element here uh but i also think you know part of what i should note is that the other thing that was informing that piece which you don't see is um i have a very difficult time with the language of progress uh i i, I and again it's it's kind of the humanitarian in me humanitarians don't usually think about progress I know human rights people do. Uh, they they get to measure progress. You know, humanitarians. It's just you know, people die. You know, and all you want to do it's you want to have better ways of intervening so that fewer people die. But you know, we're kind of like realists. It's just one war after the other, um, and it's non-ending. And so uh, this idea that there's progress somehow measured in terms of you know uh, a, a really downward trend in suffering doesn't really they don't operate in that space um you know sometimes they should but they don't so for me one of the if if i could just riff into something else for a moment if that's okay tom this is going to be one of those moments you're going to want to edit <laughs> And if you don't mind, if, if I could. Please. Yeah, go for it, Michael. Okay. So there are two things that um, I mentioned one. I'm going to spread it to two. But I'm, I've got a book manuscript that's somewhere in the works with Janice Stein. And uh, one of the – and it's a book about the end of the West. and uh the argument essentially is that at the core of the west is a notion of progress that things will get better this is the core of the enlightenment 
uh, that we can control human nature for our betterment. We can reduce human suffering on a permanent level that this is this is the story of the West. It is about progress. And then every now and then, what occurs is what uh, Max Weber and you know and, and other theologians would call a moment of theodicy, where something inexplicable occurs, an evil that needs to be reconciled with a secularized notion of progress, that the world is getting better. You know, the classic examples are World War I or the Holocaust, that this is not evil committed by others, but this is evils that we we in the West have committed amongst ourselves. And then the question of theodicy is, how do you reconcile our notions of progress with these bouts of evil? You know, what, what happens at this moment? And, you know, part of the odyssey then is, you know, and, and for most religions have a way of grappling with, you know, why bad things happen to good people. Um, but in, in the international community, I think what ends up happening is not just a form of atonement, but a kind of rallying around the idea of progress. And the way that occurs then is by building cosmopolitan institutions. And, and part of this came to me as I was researching um, my book on the history of humanitarianism, just kind of perplexed in a way that whenever evil seems to occur, the international community seems to sort of rally around, we're going to now, we're going to do what we can to make sure this never happens again. You know, genocide conventions, Geneva, uh, UDHR, you know, refugee conventions. This is, this is going to be the way we're going to up our game. You know, we don't intervene in Rwanda or Bosnia, but we'll create an ICC. So, you know, that will restore our sense of justice and humanity. And these are half-baked cosmopolitan institutions full, filled with contradictions. And, you know, and the contradictions, if you will, accumulate with each next evil because they're inevitable. Uh, why they're inevitable, you know, you'll have to talk to the Freudian in me. Um, and then the, uh, but the question is, like Emmanuel Levinas said, you know, there could be an end of theodicy. There may be a moment where we can no longer go on. We can no longer continue the charade that we really are a community of progress. And, I, and Janice and I are speculating, we are at that moment where we're at the end of progress, that we no longer have the ability to, if you will, create narratives and stories that tell us that we are going to be better. You know, there's no more Steven Pinkers to tell us that we really will continue to be nicer people than our grandparents. Um, and, you know, whether Pinker's right that, in fact, we're ignoring the progress, but the I think the zeitgeist is the end of progress as we there's no faith in it, you know. My generation knows that my children will not live as well as us. Uh, I mean, we all lament the world that we're passing down. So that's that's one. The other is, I, I've had this, you know, I've had this, you know, I'm sort of working on a paper when I have the time and sort of sitting there, um, is that I think we've moved from global governance 1.0 to global governance 2.0. And the argument is that global governance 1.0 was that liberal version of progress. It was the 1990s. It was that moment where we can actually, in our common neighborhood, we can come together, we can actually solve big problems and we can create a Pareto superior world for everybody. I mean, these are, these are, you know, even prisoners' dilemmas. In the long term, if we can stick to our contracts, we'll be fine. 
I, I've never, as I said, I've never been taken with that notion of progress. For me, the world is always precarious. Um, it's, it's one of precarity. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's because of my childhood. Maybe that's because I'm Jewish. Uh, I don't know. The world always just feels, you know, much more precarious than it does feel uh, as a, as a ethos of progress. And I think that's global governance 2.0, and we've been living that now for most of this century, in which we no longer think about solving the big problems or creating you know, a larger pie for all of us to enjoy, but it's now, how do we minimize the worst possible outcome? Uh, it, it is now trying to make sure that we don't end up in the abyss. So it is about not progress, but precarity. And I think that's the world in which we live. And by the way, Tom, I really enjoyed your article um, with your with your co-author on on risk. Because um, part of what I've been I, I've been sort of reading a lot in 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 the area of risk. Um, because, you know, I even think this this notion of global risks, complex risks. You know, you know, the discourse itself, I think, signifies how we feel about the world. And, you know, and once we and, and risk is not, as we know, is not necessarily an objective measure. It's subjective. We see the world as risky. Well, if you think the world is filled with risk and terror. That has a chilling effect on global governance. So that's kind of the you know the argument of the piece I'm 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 working on, uh, but it, you know and and I should say just as a side note, um, the kind of idea came to me because we were uh, Marty and I were asked to think about establishing a global governance program at the Elliott School here at GW, and I sat down I looked at other global governance programs, and you know I don't know when the one was started. Uh, at, at UCL, but, you know, the ones I knew were started in the early 90s with, you know, with a lot of hope, you know, we're, we're going to solve the big problems. And, you know, so last two years ago, we're sitting down and I'm thinking, okay, so what does it mean to study, to establish a global governance program at this particular moment? You know, it, it just rang hollow to me that, we would continue to use the discourse of the 1990s to think about global governance today. It just seemed, you know, out of sync. And so this is when I began to sort of play around with the fact that, you know, global governance is always a sign of the times. And I think that times have moved. So, you know, that's, that's part of, I, I, you know, this whole idea of progress, precarity, global governance, you know, for me, it's all, you know, wrapped up in these different ways. Wonderful, Michael. I, I would hope that we'll have a chance to pick this up perhaps in another forum as well. But yes, I'm very glad you enjoyed the piece I did with Julia Crowenkamp on governing complexity. And, I, you know, I, I take your point. I think this is a, a crucial conversation for us right now in the discipline. Is this going to be a global governance 3.0 or are we going to have to somehow really think about a foundational, you know, re or, or refoundation of the kind of language we're using here, perhaps taking into account Charles Pierce's notion of, you know, that we have to be cognizant of the ethics within the language that we use. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of very exciting research going on right now. In fact, actually, we just interviewed Jeff Mann, who's at Simon Fraser, uh, about his article in the Boston Review called It Was Not Supposed to End This Way, which very much picks up the theme that you're exploring in the context of liberalism's inability to narrate the Anthropocene. So we should bring you together. <laughs> we should do that. Sounds like a great conversation. Uh, you know, I've been, um, it, it, you know, like a lot of, I mean, the research is always in many ways the fun part. It's the reading and the thinking um, and then the conversations that evolve from from those things. But yeah, I think, you know, I again, I don't know if it's because I'm old, 
because uh, you know old people tend to have a lot less hope. I mean, why should we? We're just a step away from the grave. Um, but there's you know that. Uh, but you know it, it. The world is 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 stunning right now in terms of its. In, in terms of its to and fro, um, I, it's it's not like you can't make sense of it. Uh, it. It's just that you know we're we seem to be at this moment of poly crises. I don't know what you want to call it, the perfect storm. Uh, but but things seem to be piling up, uh, and the more we're aware of the interactions and linkages between all these different areas of global governance, the more, I, I think, overwhelming it seems. You just don't know which where to start pulling the thread. Uh, it, it's just, no, I'm, I'm, um, I'm quite... I, I'm in I'm in considerable despair, and you know this last week hasn't helped. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Barnett. Um, what an amazing conversation. Um, I know I personally like really enjoyed it. Um, unfortunately, we are gonna have to go to the very last question. Um, so this is a typical question that's asked of all of our podcast guests, and we just would like any advice that you have for um, people going into wishing to pursue an academic career in your field, but also people who want to possibly be part of that change to help with that progress, whether it's in um, humanitarianism or um, global governance. So do you have any advice for young people trying to navigate the world of a, a world dealing with a poly crisis? Yeah, run, run away. Uh, you know, just enjoy the party while it lasts. Um, yeah. You know, I... Put away the isms. You know, I, I think for for those who are first are getting, you know, their sea legs and are engaging in the discipline, there's a tendency to, you know, try to figure out what flag you want to fly under uh, first and then let the other things come. Um, but I think we're harmed by the paradigms oftentimes. I use them. But I don't use them as as a dogma. Um, I I think you just need to find a way to, you know, find those questions that interest you and, and stick with them. Um, and don't be, if you will, don't don't allow yourself to be fall to be following the fashion, um, whether it's in methods or theories or what have you. Uh, at, it's tough oftentimes. The toughest thing is to figure out how to ask an interesting question. Um, and, and so we rely on methods and theories as a way of trying to, if you will, cover up our shortcomings. But I would say figure out what those questions are. Um, I think second, you know, as you've suggested, um, the questions we ask are not value neutral nor should they be. Uh, I think we pick our topics because we often see an injustice or something that we find incredibly concerning that we want to address. You know, a lot of this is me search. It, it's, it's very much, you know, you, us trying to understand ourselves and the world around us through our research and our topics. And I think to the extent that you feel that there are important themes that need to be researched and probed and unpacked, then, then that's kind of what you need to do. Um, the third is, uh, I'm a big believer in social science that, you know, and it's not, that's not an argument for all our teched up methods. It's an argument for a degree of sobriety in the way we 
way we ask our questions, the research designs we have, uh, the concern for evidence, uh, and not going beyond what the data can bear uh, in terms of our interpretations. Because I, because ultimately, I think this also is what restrains us in terms of the things that we feel like we can say. Um, and, you know, for me, ultimately, and I've, I've truly believed this, I, um, is that the, the heart of social science is skepticism, skepticism of anybody else's argument, skepticism of our own, skepticism regarding what we think we know. Uh, and, you know, it, it saves us from falling in love with our theories. Uh, it allows us, I think, then to participate in a community with others who are engaged, but also skeptical. Uh, and I think that's that's incredibly important. Um, and, you know, where your ethics lie is for you to decide, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, the, the topics that I've chosen have often been about um you know lately have been about human suffering uh which is not a fun place to be uh but i i i think it's so important and i guess the last thing and it's again is something i've learned from humanitarianism is that you know one of the things that fascinates me um about humanitarianism is that there is no solid ethical place that you're always feeling unsettled. Um, that, you know, and the temptation to, if you will, take one side of the ethics or the other. I mean, you can see this now in what's going on in Israel, Palestine, where people feel like they need to line up. And for me, I'll, I will just say, I have found humanitarianism deeply helpful because of principles of humanity which apply equally to all sides. All side, you know, neither side should be dehumanized. Uh, that, you know, the humanity must, must not allow to be dragged down. And I see too many people, even at this moment, forgetting something that I think is so fundamental to whatever we have, whatever chances we have, it will, only come if we're able to recognize the humanity in others, but in doing so, recognizing what it means for us to be human as well. And I, I just think this is, you know, this will be a challenge going forward. I mean, once we've left that, if you will, global governance of 1.0, where everything goes together, and we now are in global governance 2.0, where there are a lot more ethical dilemmas, moral tensions. You know, it's going to be more important than ever for us to constantly question our ethics and to try to find something to hold on to. Uh, otherwise, we're we're lost. Well, I think that's a very profound, important point to end this conversation on. Clearly, we could continue talking for hours <laughs> and hopefully we might have an opportunity to get you back onto the podcast michael uh it'd be fascinating to discuss your your work in progress in more depth and we didn't even get to your canonical book on power in global governance <laughs> Bless power <laughs> well perhaps actually to to wrap up i mean the question which comes to my mind at the close of this very thoughtful conversation is you know power to what end which seems like a question that we're really still struggling to answer yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and to turn back to this question of, you know, the, you raised at the beginning about critical theory, um, you know, and, and, and a tip of the, a very, you know, strong tip of the hat to Bud, uh, my, my dad, my mentor, um, is, you know, power in everything. I've always had that as a, you know, especially in, in the realm of humanitarianism. Uh, it, it's a, a deep awareness that power, uh, of power in all aspects of social life. 
and you know what that means and you know unfortunately you know a lot of the power is about domination and violence and and um and other forms of control but you know there is the other side which is empowering uh and that's for me the flip side of critical theory it's not just about trying to understand and locate those underlying forces of power that work through the system and to make possible and impossible so much of life but it's also you know to to remember that critical theory was always about empowerment as well and and you know i think sometimes at least the literature that i read in critical theory and ir is that it's a there's a lot understandably it's enough to really locate those underlying sources of power and how power runs through everything and in, in, in different kinds run through so much. But we often get lost when we think about, or we often, if you will, get, you know, we, we become a little more silent when it comes to this question of empowerment and what that means. And um and I think that's and that's kind of the other side of, you know, what do we do? You know what comes next and i think for a lot of academics it's okay to say this is what i do i simply simply it's a tough job i locate power you know i'm aware of how these things work and i want to try and understand it but you know we have some occasions in which we try to lend our voices towards forms of empowerment and I think that's equally important and and very much part of the critical tradition in which I in which I exist. Brilliant. Thanks again, Michael. We really appreciate your time, uh, your serious engagement with our questions, and we look forward to speaking again. Well, thank you for making this opportunity possible, and I very much enjoyed the questions from everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. If you liked this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, other resources, listen to past shows, and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance.